Welcome to the latest edition of the OmniTalk Spotlight Series, the series that highlights the people, the companies, and the technologies that are shaping the future of retail. I'm your host, Chris Walton. And I'm Ann Mazinga. And today we are turning our attention to a topic that continues to be hot. But how hot is it, Anne? That is the I, question I we're going to explore. Where are you going with that? I know, right? Like kind of a good tease. I like that one. Okay. All right. So joining us today to share her considerable expertise, the topic we're going to talk about is micro fulfillment and joining Ooh. us to share her expertise is the market development director at Dematic, Kim Beaudry. Kim, welcome to Omni Talk. Hey, thank you so much. So happy to be here. Thanks, guys. Kim, uh, are you excited today to talk about micro fulfillment? Yes, I am excited, but I may not ever get as excited as Chris does. I know we we're joking <laughs> before. Topic. Chris has had lots of copy, and micro fulfillment is one of his favorite topics of all time, especially we just came off of a logistics conference. So yeah. it is top of mind for us. Um, I'd love before we get started here, if you wouldn't mind, Kim, tell us a little bit about you and your role at Dematic. Happy to. Thanks. Um, I actually work in a pretty unusual role in our material handling industry. Um, our company has a group of people we call market development directors. Okay. And we are not marketing although we have the word market in our title and we are not business development, even though we have development in our title. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a little confusing. I get so many emails from people wanting to talk to me at marketing and business development things. Um, no, we are actually part of corporate strategy. So we mm. work for our company to help us understand what is driving the vertical markets that we cover and the customers that are in those vertical markets. So anything that's influencing our customers, we need to know how to solve for better we need to know how to talk to the customer in the language that they understand. So that's really our responsibility at Dematic. And I cover the general merchandise and apparel retail verticals. Okay. But in general merchandise, we definitely touch in the grocery channel um, because a lot of large general merchandise retailers have grocery as part of their solution or their offerings to their customers. Kim, what are the, are there more verticals than general merchandise and grocery or like, tell us a little bit about that. Cause I, I, I know, and our audience is familiar with those verticals, but like just out of plain curiosity, like what else does this extend to? Oh, absolutely. So we have lots um, that we focus on durable manufacturing, non-durable mm -hmm. manufacturing, food, beverage, healthcare, which includes all your pharmaceutical, right. wholesale pharma, pharma manufacturing, medical devices, et cetera parcel and a really important one that's really just seeing a lot of new work come to it is uh, with the growth of e-commerce is third-party logistics okay i think right. i got them all yeah so i mean the key point there which is a great question for man is really there's a lot of breadth of knowledge and understanding at thematic around the topic we're going to explore today which is why we want to have you on the program so i want to get really candid especially since both you and ann like ann mentioned before the podcast were giving me a little a little grief for my energy level coming Never. off my coffee here this Monday Never. morning, but I want to get really candid, really to the point, really quickly. Kim, I want to know, is there one right answer when it comes to micro fulfillment? No. 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 no why not? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. Okay. Um, one is, I think. And, and this will lead into the conversation. I think we're going to get into um, to some extent and with a lot of, um, detail. One is we use the word micro fulfillment in the industry um, to describe what's really a movement to get products closer to a consumer. Mm -hmm. So micro fulfillment is a technique, a method mm. to get a product closer to a consumer. Um, mm. So when you, when you say, is there one way to handle micro fulfillment? I have to say no, because there isn't just one solution that will solve getting a product closer to a consumer. There's lots of different ways to, to, to handle that. So is micro fulfillment even the right word then? Or should we be talking about it differently? I'm curious. Well, that, well, it's really heady yeah. the way you started this out. So I'm curious, what, what's your take on that? Well, I, I'd like to use close to consumer because it encapsulates a lot more than just what we've come to know as a micro fulfillment center basically attached to a grocery store to mm -hmm. accomplish fulfillment of grocery orders, right? Mm -hmm. And even at Dematic, we have, we sometimes confuse ourselves when we use the word micro fulfillment because it's really, a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really a solution. And it, it's not taking into consideration all the different ways that we can get products closer to consumers. So when I speak about it, and um, I like to talk about close to consumer fulfillment. 
Well, I, now I feel bad because I started out like, are you excited to talk about micro fulfillment? And the whole time Kim's just like, I don't even call it that you are years behind. I know, but she went with it. She went with it. She like, she, she placated us. Yeah. That's why guest. I like Kim. I already yeah. love having her. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I do really appreciate though, Kim, the way that you, you talk about that, because I think it, it makes a lot of sense and, um, you know, it's, it's not something to be oversimplified, but what are the approaches that kind of go into that then the, the close to consumer fulfillment, you know, how does, how does automation then come into play? What are the right sure. spots? Can you kind of explain that for, for the two of us and for the audience? Yeah. So it, when I think about micro fulfillment at the baseline um, and where you'll see the first levels of automation come in is actually in the in-store fulfillment piece, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you see so many of our retailers are now using their stores as a way to ship orders direct to consumer, not just for click and collect, but they're using their, their retail inventory to do direct to consumer fulfillment as well. So they can do that manually out on the floor. I mean, we all have experienced people walking down the aisles of our stores with carts and an RF right. gun, picking right. stuff to, you know, for click and collect. Right. Um, also they're staging it for direct to consumer fulfillment. Um, so that's the baseline, right? You do the software and you use your in-store labor to do all of that fulfillment activity and you use your retail footprint to solve mm -hmm. the problem of getting an order put together. The next phase then is what, we all, I don't want to use air quotes because it's not appropriate, um, but our micro fulfillment with automation is then taking a space, dedicated space, or building a space at the end of a, a grocery store or general merchandise retailer like Walmart. Mm -hmm. um, we've partnered with Walmart on micro fulfillment in Canada, for instance, outside of Toronto. And it is your typical automated, you know, uh, shuttles um, to a goods to person workstation, that picks orders and they have them ready for somebody that um, comes and picks them up, you know, later in the day. <clears throat> so there's that, that's one set. Mm -hmm. And I don't see customers moving away from that form of fulfillment at all. I, I see it growing. Um, I see more of that activity going to move to the back room. So I'm not interacting with that person with a cart walking down my aisles. Because when I'm there shopping, I kind of want to be able to get to my stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. right. And then want to be fighting the Instacart no, right? providers and for their products. There's enough yeah. congestion that it is, but so all the activity moves to the back room, and and there we have an opportunity. Um, I think in that environment to use automation, you know, mm -hmm. things like um, shuttles, perhaps, but auto store is another example. Uh, potentially some AMRs. There's lots of different things that we can look at to solve that back room order fulfillment. It's still in the store, but we've right. got a large number of retailers announcing they're actually moving to a larger store footprint to accommodate this backroom order fulfillment. Sure. Then the second thing, if you want me to keep going. Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I, I love you even more now because you're the first person I think in history from a company that just named a competitor too. That's fantastic. So keep going. Yes. Oh, absolutely. well, they're, 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 we're cooperative. We're cooperative. You're cooperative. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, we, you know, not everybody that's, I do want to say that this kind of um, our, the way we feel at Zomatic, we can't make everything that everybody needs. Um, right. So we do partner with companies um, to do, you know, to do what our customers need. So mm -hmm. they may be a, they may be a formal partner of ours, but we also will work with custom, with companies because our customers ask us to, it's just part of what we need to do. So. No, that's yeah. great. And, and that's one thing we espouse at OmniTalk too. We always say we never endorse a technology because every retailer and every brand is different and your needs yeah. are different. So that goes yeah, right exactly. along with, with us too. So, but keep going. No, I think for sure yeah. we want you to keep going. Like, I'm curious, like what, what other ways are people trying to get closer to consumer? You've talked about the in-store side of things, but you know, we've heard things like dark stores, you know, those yeah. have kind of taken on an almost, you know, life of their own in a lot of ways. And so like, where, where does all that fit in too? Yeah, so definitely, I would say if you go outside, the next step of the store is a dark store. It would be really, yeah. really close proximity to stores and mostly in a suburban or urban environment. It can be a greenfield building that somebody pops up, but it's basically lights out um, automation, mm. or it can be an actual store that they just don't let people in. Mm. So there is a grocery store chain. I'm sorry, I can't remember them in the Northeast. that's just decided to turn all of their stores to dark stores. So no mm. customers are going in the store to pick, but all of their employees are picking orders in that environment. Mm. Um, but if you move to a system where you can have the building uh, retrofitted with automation, you know, um, uh, Tesco did this in the United Kingdom several years ago. They had 
four or five um, dark stores surrounding United, uh, London, mm -hmm. and they used full automation lights. Again, lights out automation isn't mm -hmm. completely true, but you know, end to end automation to do um, click and collect. Again, it was primarily for that. Um, you do see some customers using it for doing direct to consumer fulfillment as well. But again, it, 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 if you have a brownfield, an existing building that limits, it kind of limits a bit the type of automation you can get in that structure. And why so is that? Because I think that's an important yeah. point that we've been yeah. hearing more and more about. Well, so even in the in-store side of things, it depends on the like the store slab or the slab of a store. It's not mm -hmm. always built the same way you would at a distribution center. So some high levels of automation can cause vibration and, and issues with the slab. So things like, again, AMR or a, a system like an auto store can work in those environments. And that's why we try to have a, you know, kind of a toolkit that we pick from to work with our customers and what will work best. But yeah, dark stores would be the next thing. Um, mm -hmm. you're, we're starting to see people experiment with that. I, I don't know that we've got a lot of momentum in that space yet, just because again, some are trying to use existing, you know, store facilities. Um, Amazon is shut down, you know, taking bought malls, and I think they're going to be using those as fulfillment centers, mm -hmm. you know, clearing them out. Um, and then we have these, you know, completely um, dedicated dark stores that were built to be made for automation, right? So mm -hmm. there's that, again, in that category, there's lots of different ways you can solve the problem. And um, the idea, oh, and the idea there too, yeah. just to recap what you said is like, it's basically like, it's a, basically a smaller warehouse, essentially operating with or without automation close to the consumer. That's essentially what we're talking about here when we say yeah. we're dark store. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. The third thing that I see um, coming into play is is really kind of a metro hub, a metro, mm -hmm. and generally those are used for your direct to consumer orders, mm -hmm. but could also be used to prepare a click and collect order if they're close enough to a retail center um, for a retailer. But you, as we have all of this movement towards urbanization globally, you're going to see more and more of the our customers, and they are they're constantly trying to solve for how do I improve my customer experience by getting my orders faster to my customer, you know, um, and that's the advantage that they have over a, a dot-com retailer is that they have their store footprints and they're all over the place. So um, as they try to figure out what's the best way to service the customer, they're trying lots of different things. I don't think anybody is completely and entirely settled on one way over another, um, but you know, I think it's really, we're in an exciting time. You know, our, what we used to do used to be kind of boring. <laughs> when you, I mean, when you walk into a distribution center for years, you know, it was um, mo pick modules, people were throwing things on a conveyor, got into a shipping dock, they loaded a truck. But with the, you know, the influence or the expansion of e-commerce and then this whole, you know, the store retailer wanting to, to be provocative and different they're really looking to their stores and that network to do different things for their customers and, and really delight them, you know, when they come into the store, any experience they have with the brand, whether it be in the store or online, et cetera. Well, Kim, how do you, how would you sum up kind of the state of where the industry is then when it comes to kind of embracing this idea of close to consumer fulfillment? You, you touched on a few options, but I, I mean, we just came from a logistics conference one thing that we took away was that we're still we're still very early in in this process. So yeah. where where do you feel being an expert here and working with retailers and brands? Where are we right now, and where where do we need to go? Yeah, I think we're still at the at the experimenting stage, um, mm. and because there's so many things that going into making the decision of how to do this best. You know, we Chris and I um, shared some notes earlier, but you know, where do where's you've got to consider your inventory play because when you move product outside of your store and filling orders somewhere else, other you're duplicating your inventory, right? Mm -hmm. Then you got to look at your, your, um, your transportation cost. So what's, what's the balance of having duplicate inventory versus lower transportation, et cetera. So we work with our customers to kind of consider all that and try to figure okay. out what, you know, there is no one right way to solve this problem. And I think that, um, it's not even a problem, it's an opportunity. <laughs> so there's right. no one right way to go about it. 
And I think you have to figure out from the customer's perspective, what are their goals, right? So is it, I want to always meet the, the SLA of same day delivery or next day delivery. I always, you know, or I want to be able to use my store resources always before I want to use my distribution, first before I use my distribution resources. So I think what you have to do is, is look with them, you know, where are they on that journey? Be able to offer a crawl, walk, run approach. So, yeah. you know, very basic RF driven picking to semi-automation to full automation, if that's where they want to go. Um, I think that there, some of this will shake out and will prove to be, you know, the micro fulfillment, the typical micro fulfillment solutions, I think definitely have a place. I'm not saying that's going away yeah. mm -hmm. by any means. I mean, we participate in that. Um, but there are, you know, there, there's some nuances that would change one retailer's viewpoint on how they should solve the problem. And what's are, the best way? When you're thinking about those, those kind of strategies, or you're working through those options with, with some of the clients that you work with, what are, like, are there hurdles that they have to get over or challenges to kind of embracing, like maybe a, maybe a, um, a pick from store versus, you know, going the way of traditional distribution center and like the, exactly what you were saying, like the expectations of the consumer of, you know, is it worthwhile for us to get this to you faster or for us to be able to maintain low prices because we're using more efficient, you know, distribution centers or something like what are, what are some of those challenges that they're getting over? Yeah, um, I, one of the ones that we learned in micro fulfillment um, was having a store employee working with automation. Really? So that's that's it. Mm, I don't yeah. know that people that put dip their foot into this understand that as much. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a you've taken a person that's been working on the floor with customers facing, you know, talking to them and. Right. and that that's a different mindset than sitting yeah. in at a piece of automation all day long. There's no customer interact and you're sitting in front of, you know, a, a terminal or a good person station is telling you what to do, pick two of these, do that, do, you know, it's, it's a completely different job. Yeah. So um, I think there's part of that that we need to think about when we go into the automation. Um, and then again, the things like it's, you know, where am I keeping my inventory? It's one of the biggest things our cus customers that we speak with think about is, do I want to keep all my inventory for direct to consumer fulfillment at the store? Mm -hmm. Or do I want to keep it back at the distribution center? Or I'm doing a mixture of both because that's, that's an expensive discussion, right? Like if you have duplicate inventory or you have it in the wrong place, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's another huge consideration. Um, and then really what's my appetite for automation? Um, you know, as a company, how, do, how am I embracing that? We're seeing some traditional retailers um, starting to really move outside of their, what would have been their traditional comfort zone with regards to automation. And they are even promoting it, you know, on LinkedIn, but look at, cause they, they actually, it's a competitive advantage. Customers right. say, oh, wow, look at my, my favorite retailers, you know, doing all this great stuff to make sure my products get to me when I want them and how I want them. So, um, yeah, I think those are some things to consider. You know, what is what labor force are you using? Mm -hmm. What's my inventory play and my transportation play? And then um, what is my appetite for automation? It's okay not to have a huge appetite for automation to start <laughs> with, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what I think is, is great that we're able to go on a kind of a journey or a path with our customers to figure out where they are and, and where they want to be, where they should be in the future. Yeah, this is, a, this is a great interview. I love this interview. And um, so, I mean, a couple of things I just want to call out there that you said that you made me think about for the first time, which is a, particularly a part of the part about which employees you want working the automation in the back room. Because I think back to my store manager manager days. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have the the stock boys, for lack of a better way to describe it, stock boys or girls, whatever you want to call them. And they'd come in in the morning, get the job done, and then they leave. And then the bulk of the staff would be you know, on the floor, mm -hmm. out facing the consumers. And now when you talk about this type of model where that setup is working round the clock 24 seven, that's a complete shift in the workforce. Absolutely, You're having to hire entirely new people, which can't be the easiest thing to do right now, oh, given yeah. all the staffing shortages we're hearing about. And then the other part too is the software side of this is crazy because yeah, if you're going to mm -hmm. place your inventory in two locations, you have to figure out how your order management system is going to handle that. You have to figure out how your allocation system is going to handle that. It has to work in tune with the warehouse automation system too. So yeah, man, there's just so many things going on here. So Kim, I'm curious then, I want you to put your Nostradamus hat on for us now. 
Oh. How does <laughs> how I know, right? <laughs> On Monday morning, it's a it's a big ask. Um, how does all this play out? Like what what happens first, then what happens next? Like talk us through that in terms of the evolution of close to consumer fulfillment from an industry perspective. Okay, since this is a complete prediction and, uh, you know, <laughs> and guess, okay. basically. You don't, you don't have to be exactly right. Informed prediction. Okay. Don't come we'll after you me Vegas in a few odds years. Either way, it's fine. Yeah. Well, don't, yeah. Don't come and say, hey, Kim, you were so off. Like, <laughs> um, this is what I think. I think that there, because of our labor challenges, and again, this is a global issue. It's not just in the United States. And I don't think people... The general person that I talk to in my friend group doesn't understand that we are going to have a labor availability issue for years to come, right? So mm -hmm. I think no matter what, eventually, as our customers, our retailers strive to continue to exceed customer expectations and just do something, you know, that beats their competition, in order to have that sustainable, there will have to be automation in play right? Eventually. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I, I think there's a lot to learn between today and my fully automated mini DC that's going to service click and collect and, and direct to consumer fulfillment. Um, so I think you're going to see, because also it's just, I, I, I embarrass my children regularly while they're grown, but they still go around. We travel together a lot and I have my phone out, you know, I'm in a, in a store and I'm not going to name them, but I'm like, we were in New York City um, a couple of weeks ago, and I said, "Look at these totes in the middle of the floor. I can't even. I mean, mm -hmm. because in a in a metro environment, they don't have back rooms, mm -hmm. right? So they're dropping inventory in the middle of the floor. But and and then the store person is trying to figure out what to do with this. And I just think that there's there will be a better way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's going to be a combination of first just starting, you know, like I said, crawl with your in store." Um, staff mm -hmm. doing things manually. And then, and I'm starting to see it. I'm predicting that we're going to see some of these retailers are saying I'm doing back room. I'm making my, my store is bigger to do back room fulfillment is perfect for automation. Mm -hmm. We've done it with customers um, to Cathlon and Martinique where we have automation in their back room to help them, you know, fill their, their, their orders out of the store. So I think we'll see that progression. And I think we'll see it probably happen pretty, probably in the next five years, I think we'll start seeing more clear paths on which way customers are gonna go with that. Um, because again, I, the, we just don't have the people to do the work. And if you wanna do it efficiently, and, because if you don't do it efficiently, you're either gonna, you're gonna do a couple of things. You're gonna waste your money mm -hmm. and you're gonna upset your customers. So that's, my prediction. I think that we will see more automated mini DCs either close to the, the store or in the back room of the store. And um, making those two worlds work together will be an interesting, you know, path for us to all go down the store and the uh, distribution center kind of in the same place. Got it. So what you're saying then, if I sum up, is you're saying you're going to see more of the retail industry try to shift their operations to the back room. And then that is therefore going to require, based on the points you were making before, better training and staffing to that new operational design, so to speak. And then last but not least, there's going to be the element of adding automation when you get to that point. Is that the right summary there then? Yes. And I also want to say that it's, it might not be always backroom. I think the growth of the dark okay. store um, will okay. also be a trend that we'll see. Because of that issue that we talked about, I think when you're they're either going to have to have a dedicated backroom staff that does right. order fulfillment all day long um, so that doesn't trouble the front of the, the front you of know, us. the building yeah. um, mm -hmm. worker. So a dark store allows you to do that because those people just, that's what they do. They fill orders just like you do in a distribution center. So I think you, you'll see a combination of those two things happening. Um, and automation Back makes or sense out of store, basically. Yeah, yeah. Back yeah. or out of store. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure. Kim, what does that look like then once it starts to uh, expand more like at a macro level? Because I'm, I'm curious, like I, I'm just thinking about myself, like as a former work, you know, store floor employee at J. Crew or whatever, like yep. what is it? What does a day in your life look like once this this automation starts to expand? What you know, what is your role 
how are we seeing like other markets who might be further ahead of the U.S. in this? Like, how are we going to see what's happening there kind of start to take place here in the U.S.? Yeah, um, well, you know, the other countries are driving the automation journey faster because their their land is more. So they've had to go to smaller distribution. I'm, sure. I'm not smaller. They've had to go to distribution centers that are vertical instead of right. horizontal mm. in many countries outside of the U.S. So they are already, in a way, adapting to this concept of working in a highly automated. Because it, it, as they get closer to the to the city centers, their land costs more, and their and the people that they employ in the distribution center costs a lot more. Mm -hmm. So they're dealing with you know three, four, five level um, buildings where they're automating. And so I think that they're ready, a little bit more ready for this you know, concept of having even a smaller DC closer to the urban environment. Sure. But I also think some interesting things happen um, where the retailers, like I said, on LinkedIn, they're publicizing all this right. automation that they're investing in as like a competitive advantage. But a lot of them are actually wanting to showcase the automation in the store. So they're talking about having like a glass window like a car to look in the back room, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. right? Right. So some really creative, interesting things, you know. So again, I think the store employee, if you're working in, I know that if I go into J. Crew and I want some help, right. or 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 you know anywhere, like I, you know, I want store help. I don't. I want to be able to interact with you. I don't. Right. right? I want to. I don't want you worrying about somebody else's order when I'm in there trying to buy my stuff. So, I think that it's segregating that workforce will eventually make enough sense that, you know, that that, that you have a, a store fulfillment person right. or order fulfillment person and a store customer facing person. Right. Yeah. I, I wonder, like, that's what I exactly kind of what I was thinking was like, do you, in, like, do you end up, you know, instead of going and going through and scaling racks in the back room to get a size for somebody on, you know, on the floor, are you able to use automation to like, you know, I need a size medium turtleneck or whatever. And then it's yeah. coming to you. Like you're able to use the same picking almost that you would be if you were fulfilling an online order, or if you're helping somebody in store just to like get it more quickly. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, then my brain goes into a lot of different technologies we right. could use. Right. Like, you know, like for that, it'd be like a, the, overhead pocket sorters, pocket yeah. pocket yeah. sorters yeah. right yeah. right and you got to have some space for that but it's all yeah. overhead you right. know so um and when you walk into stores and these big box retailers we have i mean you ever look up and go wow there's a lot of space up there right there is yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. especially um, big box. so there's lots of different things you know that could be experimented with especially in apparel because you you're saying i need this size and this color and right go sort it and bring it to me right so yeah very interesting Kim, let's get you out here on this. Just one quick question. Then does okay. net, does net net that mean that, you know, on average, the, the distribution centers we're going to build here in the future get smaller, at least here in the United States? Yeah, I think so. I think we're already seeing that happen. Um, you know, there's network strategy rationalization. And first of all, you know, you, we used to talk to customers about, well, I've got an East Coast DC, but I, it takes me forever and a lot of money to, to, to service my customers on the West Coast. So they would do East Coast, West Coast, and then they started doing regional, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we're starting to see our customers that have done that, adding these metro hubs, right? Or getting something smaller. So um, I think, yes, because of to service where our people are living and to, to meet those expectations of getting my product quickly, you're gonna see smaller DCs. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's still be a case for large regional VCs to su supplement the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. But if you go to Europe, um, there's very few million square foot, you know, um, distribution centers uh, because the land is so expensive. And, um, you know, again, they're they're also trying to meet the, the customer requirements. But I think we've had in North America the advantage of having cheap land and relatively cheap mm -hmm. labor. And I don't think those things are going to continue to exist for us so right and where that land is doesn't put you closer to the consumer which no exactly i mean you, you know <laughs> at the very beginning right right, right. Yeah. and awesome. the, the upper peninsula of michigan no don't see a lot of distribution centers. <laughs> <laughs> right 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 all right well that was great that was so wonderful i, I love this interview this mm -hmm. is one of my favorites for sure um uh, so Kim, if people found this conversation interesting, want to get in touch with you, want to get in touch with Domatic, like what's the best way for them to do that? 
Oh, that'd be great. I'd love to talk to people more about this topic. Um, you certainly can follow me or uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's just Kim Baudry, B-A-U-D-R-Y. Uh, sounds like Baudry, looks like Baudry, but it's, you say it Baudry. Is that Cajun? Um, or what's that? It's Is it Cajun? Cajun? It's actually, it's French. French. Yes, it's French. French. Cajun. Yeah. French. Wow, nice. Yeah. Oh, nice. I've got family in New Orleans nice. and Baudry is definitely oh, yeah, the right. way that right. you yeah. Uh, yeah. pronounce that last name. When it, yeah, if you go to, if I go to France, people know how to say my name, yeah. <laughs> otherwise they don't, <laughs> or wow. in New Orleans. Um, and then also Kimberly, which is K-I-M-B-E-R-L-E-Y, my mom put that E in there, special, dot Baudry at dematic.com. Awesome. Great. Well, hey, that wraps us up. Thanks to Kim Baudry of Dematic for sitting down with us today. And thanks to all of you for listening in. And as always, on behalf of Anne and all of us at Talk, be careful out there.